of Colorado's oil and gas industry have been furious with new regulations. You know who else is furious? Opponents of the oil and gas industry. While regulators are writing the new rules that will impact both jobs and public health, our new Roy watched them get an earful from every direction. And some of you have been here and some of you have not. You're going to have to answer to your grandchildren, what did you do? Because you were in a position of power. Tens of thousands of people in Colorado here want to provide a good quality of life and a healthy quality of life to their kids, which is why we work in this industry. There's a lot of anger and emotion, a lot of fear, despair in this room. Behind the strong words and the loud chants at this Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission meeting, a lot of people wanted to be heard about Senate Bill 181 and why permits are still being issued when the state just started working on new rules to put health and safety before oil and gas development. Here's a look at the heart of the issue from two perspectives worth listening to. Cold, flus, ear infection. A mother and the state. They need to put a halt on permits until they figure out what the new bill means and how they can implement it and actually figure out a way to make health and safety first. So that is not what the legislature and the governor envisioned when he signed um, this bill. Um, they envisioned that actually permits do move forward. The blank stares, you know, I, I, it's, it's all what I've seen before. This isn't the first time I've shared my testimony. I imagine as the rules are implemented that there will be different conditions um, um, put on different permits. I can't just sit by. I can't just like go up in my little cabin in the woods and pretend like all of this is okay. Um, you know, that's my conscience just won't let me do that. <laughs> There's a lot of emotion behind this issue and we understand that. Um, you know, I think what this commission is trying to do is actually some of the things that they're asking to do. So since that bill became law in April, COGCC signed off on around 339 drilling permits. And Kyle, they've got about a year until next July now to finalize all of the rules that are going to be around Senate Bill 181 and how it's going to be implemented. Governor pushed for these regulations. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of control over that regulatory board. What's he make of this? Yeah, so when we asked them, he basically was just encouraging people to stay respectful through the whole process because at one point today, public comment had to be paused because the commission said people need to cool down because everyone one's interrupting each other. Hmm. All right. Thank you, Anusha. Democratic Governor Jared Polis, he, he made a promise in his State of the State address in January. He promised to make health care more affordable for Coloradans. We will work with you to establish a reinsurance program to reduce costs and save Coloradans money. Well, you can mark that as a Polis promise kept with an assist from the Trump administration. So now, reinsurance is a complicated concept, but the end result is a savings on health care. The federal approval today means that Colorado gets federal tax dollars that are going to go to insurance companies to pay for expensive claims. In turn, the individual market that serves about a quarter million Coloradans should be able to offer cheaper premiums. That means that more people can get covered. But what about the majority of Coloradans who get their insurance through work? What's in it for them? One of the biggest costs in health care is the cost of the uninsured. Uninsured people go into a hospital. The hospital basically spreads those costs about other people. You're paying more because you're paying for the cost of the uninsured. Right now, we're about 6 or 7% uninsured. If that comes down a percent or so, that'll save money no matter how you buy your insurance. Now, the only way that this works for Colorado is if the ACA, Obamacare, still stands. If the Affordable Care Act goes away, then so would the federal money that supports this plan to reduce health care costs in Colorado. So that makes it interesting that uh, Republican Senator Cory Gardner is claiming credit today for helping to make this happen. Uh, because, as you well know, uh, Gardner and a lot of Republicans want to appeal a uh, repeal Obamacare. They want to take it away. They want to replace it with something else. So repealing Obamacare, again, means ending this program that Gardner today says he helped to create. His folks have told me that Governor Polis had asked Senator Gardner to talk with the Trump administration to make this happen, and the senator did, despite his personal opposition to the Affordable Care Act. Again, we get it. All of this is complicated, so perhaps a metaphor will help. Senator Gardner wants to demolish the House, but today he's claiming credit for helping the homeowners put on an addition. Conservative opponents of Democrats' national popular vote law in our state are real confident that they are going to get this on the ballot so that all of us will decide the issue. Coloradans Vote, this group, said today that they have collected 227,000 signatures. That is a whopping number because they only need 124,000 signatures to be valid. They're trying to stop Colorado from joining a group of states 
that promises to award electoral votes to the national popular vote winner. This next goes to the Secretary of State to certify those signatures. We have been getting some feedback from drivers who are upset with my commentary asking for respect for cyclists on our streets and roads. Common thing we've heard is drivers saying that cyclists have no place on roads that they have not paid for through driver's licenses and uh, registration fees and so forth. They say that if people want to ride their bikes on the roads, then they should pay to maintain them. We asked our Steve Steger to look into road funding to see who's really paying the bill. But I think people care deeply about the perceived fairness of their taxes, uh, but we need to make sure that the resulting system makes sense. Let's start at the state level. CDOT tells me every year at least 10% of its budget comes from sources unrelated to federal and state gas taxes and vehicle registrations. But you're not as likely to see a bike riding down a highway or other state roadway as you are to see them in a city. And local roadways are funded differently. When you're talking specifically about local roads, which is where you're going to find the bulk of our bikeway infrastructure, we are actually talking mostly about property taxes that are going to fund into those improvements. Denver's Capital Improvement Fund for Roadways is about $150 million. The city says $8 million of that comes from gas taxes and vehicle registrations. That makes up about 5% of the fund. The overwhelming majority of those dollars are going to come through property tax and through our general fund, which is funded through a variety of taxes, everything from sales taxes to occupational taxes that you might pay if you stay in a hotel. So in a way, everyone is paying to maintain Denver's roads. Fitting, since a city survey shows 90% of Denver households own vehicles. The Nonpartisan Tax Foundation says when you think about cyclists, you have to think about the way they're using the roads. Uh, there are really three reasons why we tax road usage, and mostly we're thinking cars and trucks when we're doing that. One of those is to account for congestion. Another is wear and tear on the roads. And the third is the environmental impact, the emissions. Of course, two of these just aren't relevant to bicycles. So there's that third element, congestion. We found two examples of governments taxing bikes for that. Oregon recently implemented a statewide $15 excise tax on bikes when you buy them to fund bike infrastructure. And Colorado Springs has had a $4 excise tax on bikes to fund bike paths and such since 1988. The city says revenues on that tax have ranged from about seventy-seven dollars to $85,000 annually over the last six years, Kyle. Not as simple as people thought. Not as simple at all, but it's interesting to see that it, when you look at the ro local road funding, only about 5% of that is funded through the usage fees that we typically see to use roadways. As we were talking about this today with folks on social media, my favorite comment was, does anybody really think that drivers will be more careful if they think that they're gonna hit somebody who paid a tax to be on the road like, as are, opposed to otherwise? Yeah, so, are they gonna be looking for that license plate on my bike? Yeah, my oh, bike? I'll respect your life because you paid a tax. All right, thanks, Steve. So you remember when, when a, a rock fell on a road in Southern Colorado and the state was like, yeah, that rock's huge. Let's just leave it there. They finished rebuilding the road around the rock. So Memorial Rock, as the state has named it, now sits on the shoulder of Highway 145 near Dolores. See, I spent nine weeks rebuilding the road around that eight million pound boulder that came down Memorial Day weekend. The state insists that rebuilding the road was $200,000 cheaper than removing the rock. The end product cost just over a million dollars. So it's funny, you know, seeing candidates from Colorado on the stage during the presidential debates, well, <laughs> savor the flavor because it might not last long. The criteria to qualify for future debates in the Democratic primary for president, it gets tougher and tougher. And people like former Governor Hickenlooper and Senator Michael Bennett, they're kind of on the margins. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger is getting ready for <laughs> debate night part two at his desk. You're so invested in this, you won't even come in the studio to talk to me. You just sit at your desk. It's too much work to go like the 30 feet that direction when I can watch all of the 20 minutes of pre-show here for the debate. You know, I hate to say that the bar was set low for the qualifications that allow Colorado Senator Michael Bennett and former Governor John Hickenlooper to participate in this debate and the debate back in June in Miami, but they really were low. Here is the criteria on the left side of my screen for the first two debates. They either needed to qualify with 65,000 unique donors. Uh, spoiler alert, neither Bennett or Hickenlooper met this criteria, uh, which also required 200 donors or more uh, from 20 or more states. What they did qualify with was 1% or higher showing in three different polls. Well, the next debate in Houston in September and the debate after that will require double this 
and both. So 130,000 unique donors, 400 from 20 or more states, and 2% or higher in four polls. I did a quick search of the actual contributions, Kyle, for both Bennett and Hickenlooper. They're in the thousands, not the 130,000 range that they need for September. So as we said with Hickenlooper and his do or die moment last night, the wacky waving inflatable flailing arm two man moment, Bennett's going to need something like that to stand out. You think he's going to wave his arms in the air like that? If he does, I'll do this again, and you'll see it again in the morning show, and we'll have new memes and GIFs or GIFs or however you want to pronounce it, and he'll go viral, but he, he's still not at that 130,000 donors yet. Yeah, all right. It's a steep climb for both those guys. All right, thank you, Marshall. Watching former Governor Hickenlooper on the debate stage last night was honestly kind of painful especially seeing fellow unknown moderates like Governor Steve Bullock and former Congressman John Delaney do what Hickenlooper seemingly could not. Those guys drew clear contrast with the liberal frontrunners, and they got the audience's attention. Now listen, Hickenlooper, he is a skilled politician. He got things done in the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. Whether or not you like his politics, he got stuff done. But you cannot deny, Hickenlooper has never faced top-tier opposition. The people Hick beat in order were a city auditor, a sewer inspector, the guy who said bomb Mecca, the guy who thought bike shares were a UN conspiracy, and the guy who'd previously lost a governor's race by 17 points. He finished just three points behind Hick. When it comes to Hick and Looper's past opponents, to paraphrase President Trump, Republicans weren't sending their best. Maybe Hick and Looper wants to come home to face Senator Cory Gardner. Maybe he doesn't. Denver's rush hour has seen it all. Crashes and congestions and torpedoes. There were six World War II style torpedoes on board the truck. Three of the containers were damaged. One was leaking a fluid. 35 years ago this week, the way Denver drives changed. And kids love toys. Toys are fun, but they're not just fun. And I read about how, how important toys are to a child's development. Einstein said toys are a child's research laboratory. This group knows the value of a toy. It's why they've made two million of them. That's next. The rain fell. All of the rain that they expected in 1976, it fell on that one day, this day, 43 years ago. The rain fell. The Big Thompson rose, squeezed up the canyon walls, a literal force of nature, racing towards Coloradans and tourists living in a time when we hadn't figured out how to forecast, how to warn of the worst. 144 lives were lost that day. That included heroes, like State Patrol Sergeant Willis Purdy, who got hundreds of people out before his final radio transmission, saying that he was stuck, that he couldn't get out. That day, this day, 43 years ago, there was no escape for so many, no escape from Colorado's deadliest natural disaster. Another warm summer day in Colorado with temperatures in the 90s this afternoon, but a bit of a cooling trend the next couple of days as tropical moisture feeds in from the southwest and will transport thunderstorms off the foothills over the urban corridor. I haven't seen much in the way of rain or thunder along the I-25, kind of that stretch Denver up to Cheyenne, but out on the eastern plains, I-70 and I-76, finally starting to see a little bit of thunderstorm activity that will intensify by this time tomorrow afternoon. And the steering winds aloft are pretty weak, so these storms will move slow and that means the biggest threat from storms tomorrow will be heavy rainfall, something we'll be tracking for you throughout the afternoon. In Denver tonight, still the chance of a brief rain shower, a little lightning, our low 62 with clearing late. Tomorrow, not as hot, highs in the mid-80s with late day showers and storms likely both Thursday and Friday. Mild and dry heading into the weekend and the first few days of August, seasonal highs near 90 and some welcome rain showers up the Loveland Ski Area with a beautiful view of I-70 this afternoon, Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. A guy named Marlon Dorhout came home to Denver from a trip to Nicaragua, came home so moved by what he had seen there that he made it his mission to get toys to children living in poverty around the world. Now, 19 years later, his group, Toys for God's Kids, has 300 volunteers and about 2 million toys. We've got 2 billion kids, that's with a B, that don't have a toy in the world. I mean, that's a lot of people. 
A kid growing up without a toy is, is a disaster, generally speaking. So uh, what better thing to do than to make toys for kids? I started it in 2000 after I got back from Nicaragua. I went there with Habitat for Humanity and I took some wooden toys along and they went over like gangbusters. So that, I figured that's what I'll do when I retire. Well, it started in 2000 and we made the two millionth toy today. A lot of these places, they don't have toys. I think it's great. I think they'll be happy to get them. And some are really beautiful. Look at there. The thing that amazed me was that the people making the toys, they got just as big a kick out of it as the kids getting them. <laughs> I called this a 34 Ford with a rumble seat, but I was born in 33, so. <laughs> well, until we finish with two billion, then we'll, we'll, we'll make toys. Then we're gonna go to airplanes after that. I'm just kidding, of course. Denver's rush hour isn't easy, but be thankful that you aren't swerving around torpedoes in the road like people were 35 years ago this week. Real live explosives at I-25 and I-70. Our reporter on the story in 1984 was Rick Salinger. Our reporter on the story tonight is Mark Salinger. It couldn't have happened at a worse place or at a worse time. The truck skidded 75 feet over turning as it came south on I-25 turning east onto I-70. It was one of the worst commutes in the history of Denver. There were six World War II style torpedoes on board the truck. Three of the containers were damaged. One was leaking a fluid. Highways shut down, neighborhoods evacuated, and torpedoes headed for a submarine base in Connecticut lay bruised along the busiest highways in the city. So if the fuel had ignited, the uh, torpedoes could have uh, exploded. It took four hours for crews to arrive and evaluate the scene. And so all they could do was wait. Wait for the teams from Fort Carson to arrive to determine just how serious the situation really was. They determined it was safe to load the torpedoes back into the truck. No explosion. A generation later, that crash still impacts how hazardous materials are transported throughout the country. What were you thinking when you first heard it? And, uh, and it was like, like, oh my goodness, this is, this is huge. Tony Massaro was Denver's Director of Environmental Affairs on that morning in August of 1984. Quite memorable. After the crash, the state legislature passed bills requiring truckers to take routes around the city when transporting dangerous materials. The goal of those was to, to minimize the risk to um, large population of people. The truck bearing the torpedoes was moved out. Seven hours of gridlock, fear and uncertainty ended with a motorcade through Denver. It was accompanied by an ambulance and fire truck. The destination, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Three decades later, the torpedoes that had brought Denver a rush hour mess and a scare. It's still the type of story you'd tell your kids. For next, Rick Salinger, 9 News. I'm Mark Salinger. Love that story. Tony Massaro from the city says that thinking back on that day, it was the scariest of his career. He says he cannot even imagine how many people could have been lost if those, tor if those torpedoes exploded. You have some strong feedback tonight about things said and unsaid. You get the last word. Bonnie says, why do people assume that those riding bikes also don't own a vehicle? Well, because it's easier to assume than to find answers. A note from John says, Steve Stager's piece on how taxes are used regarding bikes, well-researched, nicely presented. Kudos to journalism.